Welcome to NavChat, the show for the New Zealand orienteering and navigation sports community. Hey Tom, how's it going? Good, good. How are you? Yeah, I'm well, I'm well. I've got some running under my belt again, so I've been injured for quite a while, but I finally got some running going again and looking forward to turning up at an orienteering race. Uh, as as an athlete, as opposed to helping with the organising, like I did at New Zealand Champs, um, how was New Zealand Champs for you? Uh, it was tough. It was hard. It was a change of pace from God's own. I'll tell you that. Um, yeah. But it was a great fun. I was pretty satisfied with my races. A bit rusty at the beginning, uh, but overall pretty pretty pleased. Mm. Um, I think it was. It was cool to see a little bit of a change in the order amongst some of the elites. There were some guys who had some really good performances um, and moved up a little bit. Um, it really made me feel quite old. Uh, people who I would think of as MW, M&W 14s were now running quite well in elites, which was mm. somewhat confronting. Yeah. <laughs> How did you find the sprint? That was the first time I think we've seen artificial fences used. I actually didn't make it to the sprint. I I had to oh, work. Yeah. So no, I only did the forest event. I only stuck to the traditional. Um, mm. I imagine I would have been far too slow to be anywhere near the front of the sprint. I missed mm. the knockout sprint as well, which I think was another cool new innovation that yeah. they ran this year at nationals. Um, yeah. How about you? How was it being on the other side of nationals, organising? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that was the first time I haven't run nationals since maybe 2007 or something. Um, so it's always been one of the major uh, events for me and largely that's well, because it's fun, but it's also been a selection race for junior world champs or, or walk and stuff like that. So it's always been quite important for me to to turn up in some reasonable shape. And that was the first time this year that I haven't because of actually well, both last two years because of an injury. So uh, I, it was my club, Northwest Orienteering, that was running it. So I put my hand up to do controlling for the long distance. And that was interesting. Uh, I was um, a, like, I definitely lost a bit of sleep heading into it. Uh, I've pretty chill being controller for local events, but yeah, I was pretty, pretty concerned that something would go wrong and you're just double checking a number of things. And there are a number of last minute changes that didn't have the level of double checking that I would have liked, uh, but we didn't have the time. So, Came off pretty well, I reckon. I think the, yeah. the, the long was a, a good challenging day. And I mean, the winning times were pretty close. Yeah, I think we, we did both things fairly well uh, as far as the quality goes. And I guess we weren't that concerned about the quality, but it's it's like a catastrophic error, like putting your control in the wrong place or... Getting your numbers around the wrong that, like, Yeah, doing something funky on the computer where you've got the numbers wrong or there's like a number wrong in the control descriptions on the mm. on people's arms or yeah something like that it just ruins a number of people's races yeah. uh, it's a real nightmare situation for an organizer and i don't think we saw it in any of the races so that was a big relief to the organizing team nice well this month we're going to focus a bit more on the organizing side of nationals and We've got some speakers coming up first. Um, who, who are we hearing from this month? Yeah, so I reached out to Daniel Moncton and Jan Jaeger, who were sitting behind the Finnish computer most of the time at New Zealand Champs. And they set up the software that runs uh, the, the timing system, the Sport Ident timing system, and also the Olynx radio controls. And that was bringing uh, the splits into uh, me on commentary and onto those dis- the TV displays. So a pretty critical part of running a successful nationals is having that technology working. It, it really, uh, it the really talks is get, The talks get pretty technical pretty quick. Should we do want to just, you were going to clarify a few, a little bit of terminology first before we go? Yeah, yeah. So I think most clubs are pretty familiar with the sport ident boxes, which replace the old clip cards where you used to have a piece of paper and punch it. Uh, now, now, we've got dibber, out, now we've yeah. got dibbers. <laughs> now you have a sport ident in one, in one hand. Some people call it a dibber. Some people call it an e-card. And that replaces the flappy clip card. And you've got 
the electronic box that sits on the control. And so the SI box is what we're referring to is the plastic box with the electronics in it that sits on top of the control stand. And the SI card is the timer, timing chip on the finger. And the radio controls or radio transmitters uh, are the, you, you may not have seen them, but you, you may have seen them around. And little white boxes with a with a little antenna on it, right? That's right. They're they're probably only, yeah, like like that big, and they are sitting somewhere near the control. Sometimes they're attached onto the control, and if you haven't seen them, then that's good for you. You're concentrating, um, and they've got an antenna that's yeah, thirty or so centimeters, cool. uh, sticking up out of them, and so those are used to transmit the signals around in the forest back to the finish. So commentary and results can kind of get updated. All right, let's hear from Daniel and Jan. Yeah, let's hear from them. Hi. Hey, Daniel. Thanks for, thanks for coming on NavChat. So Tom and I are here, keen to hear a little bit about the computer side of the event setups for major orientation events. And I think in the future, more minor orientation events as the setup gets easier mm. and more people become familiar with it and it's easier to roll out. So what kind of stuff have you been involved with? Um, so I started off just helping out at the local Auckland Sprint Series. Um, this was back when we used OE 2010. And then Sorry, alongside- OE 2010? Uh, OE 20 is the, um, it's the, it used to be the main or one of the only softwares for sport and for orienteering. And I think it was uh, made by some guy in Sweden um, a long time ago, and it never really uh, took off or got updated. And recently, um, Philip Harries from Hawke's Bay, he met, created this program called Olynx, which has just come out a few years ago. And this has really taken off because it's made orienteering a lot more spectator friendly. And with the addition of radio controls and live results that you could have on the internet as the event is happening, makes it a lot, I guess, a lot more exciting to watch. So I, alongside Karen Dalal, who used to, who I used to go to high school with, um, we learned we learned Olynx as it came out, and then ever since then I've kind of picked it up and I've been using it mostly instead of the other one for pretty much all the events I've been doing since then. Yeah. Cool. So can you give us a little look and insight into? what the setup might look like for an event and what things need to be considered when you're setting up the software to do the live results and commentary for orienteering events. Yep, so should I just share my screen? Um, um, Sorry, can I share my screen? Yep. Yeah, sweet. Sweet. So this is what um, Olynx looks like. Um, it's pretty straightforward. It's mostly, it's formatted like an Excel spreadsheet. Um, you've got a uh, lot of the tabs across the top sort of show the different. Hey, Daniel, I think elements. I've got a blank screen coming through. Oh, uh, hang on. Let's try this again. Um, I've never seen that before, but it was not 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 even black. Like it just said, Daniel is sharing his screen. <laughs> oh, in text. Uh, <laughs> no image. So, can you see that now? Cool. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so so this is um, Olynx. Um, along the t so it's basically like a a spreadsheet, like an Excel spreadsheet. Um, along the top, you've got all the tabs, which are the main functions. Um, you basically, when you open this up, you just go to the events tab. And these are all the events, past events that I've had. Um, all you need to do is just create a new event. And you just type in all the information about the event. Normally the date, the most important things are the date. Um, you just need to create like a generic code for the event. It's sort of like a unique identifier just to keep it um, separate from all the others. A bit of a description, what kind of event it is, where it, where it's where it's happening, 
um, this here, this ID, you put this on to so that you could upload the results to Olynx Live. And then a dictionary here, this is sort of like, I guess if you were going to have school events and club events, they would kind of be completely separate grades and um, categories and, as such. So you could um, create dictionaries for, for specific events that you know are going to use the same course structure or the same clubs um, under there. And then once you've done all that, you just set, set up the event. Um, this one is one from last year. It's just a school sprint event. Um, so these are all the entries. Um, you can actually, there's a few ways to import them in. Um, you can just import the entries here through a Excel spreadsheet. So all you can do is have an Excel spreadsheet set up of all the name, the grade, the course, and you can import it through here. Or you can okay, just- so go, just to ask about the entry stuff, would that typically get downloaded from the entry website? Yeah, so uh, most of the time you just get given an Excel spreadsheet that the organizers have collected all the data in um there's a new sort of software called intero which has actually made this a lot easier because they 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 have it all formatted correctly and all you need to do is just basically okay. just import it in there's no like rearranging of the data or anything it just just literally you just import the file in um actually one of the things you need to do before this though is under the courses tab is you need to import the courses and this this comes from the course setter of the race. Um, they they set these courses in OCAD or Purple Pen or wherever, and they export what we call an XML file. And this is basically, it basically is just a, a text document that has all the control numbers and what order they're going to be in and the length as such. So this gets imported in, and this is sort of like the way that the computer knows um, the exact order of all the control numbers so that it can tell you if you've mispunched as such. Um, and so this gets imported in and all the, all the courses are here. Then you can put in the entries and then the entries should match up with the courses that you've put in. And that's pretty much all you need to do is to set up the event. Cool. So what I can see is that you've got information coming from the event entry system yep. and you've got information coming from the course planner Yep. And that's coming together in yep. this Olynx software. Yep. How does the software know? Do you have to get the names of the courses yep. exactly? The so same you just to have to, yeah. So you just have to make sure that the the the, the name of the course um, that the course that it gives you is the same as the name that they've been entered under. Um, a, another way to do that is just in the Excel spreadsheet that you get given from the 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 entries just to make sure that the name's the same. Sometimes you might just have to change it um, just so that it's the same when you put it in. Right. Otherwise, yeah. you'll have yeah courses one to ten imported yeah, yeah. from the event software and yeah. maybe courses named differently. Courses yeah yeah A B C D or something from um, the course setter, and then you'll have ten or you know, twenty different courses in here. Yeah yeah yeah. Line up. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the other way you can do it is manually enter everyone individually. So like this is this is for pre-entries, but if you were just to have a race where it's just all enter on the day, you could just have a function where you just manually just enter somebody in and the courses are all here and you can just select them. Um, so oh, I've seen Sorry. some some events <coughs> where you insert your sport ID card at registration yep. and that then goes through. Is that using... Olinks? Uh, yes. So you've got under Olinks, there's actually a few other programs. Um, you've got you've got Olinks Touch, Olinks Tools, and Olinks Results. So Olinks Touch is for you would use that for um, some clubs tend to have like a tablet or a laptop set up that you can um, for entering people in on the day. So that you can just put literally put your spoiler in and type your name in, select your club, and it will just put it straight in. So that's a separate program that you would operate on a different laptop as such. And then this one here is for doing um, uh, online results, but that, that gets a bit more complicated. And then here, results, this is for like displaying on TV. So I've actually got it set up on another tab here. 
So this is an, a result sort of setup yeah. screen. I can still only see the uh, oh, um, Rolex uh, events. So I think you're, you're sharing the window. Sharing. As a, share yeah, so share screen as opposed results. to share window. That one. This one. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is the results sort of set up. Um, this is just basically just done by going new results like course, and you can just import the courses in that you've done. And then as long as you've got this and the other one open, then they should just update as the competitors come through. And this is also just, an, and you've got heaps of options here for like showing the results. So this is just one op, uh, showing like recent competitors um, that have finished. So this will update of all the people that have just punched the finish. Um, you've got other options here of um, if you had radio controls, that will be here as well. So you can put up um, radio points as well to show who's come through the radios. And you can give these to the commentator as well. Um, and also you've got options for like if you were doing a row gain or an enduro um, or a relay as well. They're, they're all through here. I'm quite familiar with the little boxes on the left. I think we see them. Yeah, often on the results displays, uh, but that one on the right is the kind of thing that a, a commentator yeah uh, might see. I, I don't think I've seen them on the results computers. Yeah, they don't tend to be on the results because P, the, this tends to um, update quite frequently and it can be hard to read. Um, whereas I feel like spectators are more interested in the overall sort of rankings of everyone and together so and also yeah it can be hard to fit all the grades on one screen as well cool. so yeah. that results that is displaying the finish how is that information getting to the computers and how are the computers connected together i know there's always a computer at the finish but the computer yeah. might also have a different computer and maybe there's a different computer that's running yeah. the results screens how do they talk so this is when it gets a bit more complicated so a basic setup would be have this on the same laptop and then have an HDMI coming out of this lap, the, the main lap, the laptop that you're, you're downloading people off just to a TV and then just basically drag this window and put it on the TV. And, and that's so just you're a basic essentially setup. got like two monitors on the so same So basically computer. it's just two monitors, one computer. And that's the simple setup for like an, a, a low key club event. But when you have a big event where you have multiple screens, multiple laptops, then you've got to start by setting up a network and this is when it gets really complicated because you've got to have a sort of a, uh, a main laptop which all the information is going into and then you've got to set up a sort of like a, a local network that talks to that laptop and a way of doing that is by uh, where you tend to just have a little modem or a little internet router that we have at the events and all the computers connect to that router and then you can access this event through that router on all the laptops. And then there'll be a laptop for the commentator. There'll be a laptop at download. There'll be a laptop at the TV results stand. And then as people come in, the information will then basically just get shared across all the laptops. And then you can basically see it as it's happening. But yeah. So is it, is it that the finished computer has all the information that the other computers are checking against? Yes. Or do all computers end up having the same set of data? Uh, it's all pretty much based off the one master laptop and the one master laptop is pretty much at download because you, you basically, you, as the competitors come in from the finish and download, you want that data because that that's the data because just in case all the other laptops kind of died or packed up, you want a master laptop that you can keep all the, the data locally just as a as a as a backup in case I don't know the network fails or something. Yeah. So then that that's that's where it's all coming into, and then basically it's sort of like an extension from that is where all the other laptops are getting the, the information from. Cool. And yeah. so you're getting into that master computer, you're getting the download box, which is connected yep. by a USB cable to that just computer. Used, yep. And how is the radio information getting to that? Computer? Um. So I'll just go back to the uh, the event. 
here. So in the Onyx event, to the side here, you've got um, an option for radios. So this is the radio set up here. And what happens with radios is that there's a master radio and then a bunch of other radios and all the radios uh, are, are designed that, that they will act as a sort of a relay of information between them. So as long as you set up the, the radios that are that they they can see each other as we call it um that basically all they need to do is just be by a control site and the information will get passed to the computer and basically all it is is the master of the radio is basically it connects to a usb port on your on the master laptop and then so you plug it into your master laptop and have it by the download or somewhere high by the finish and then you set up the other radio points by, I don't know, maybe a finish control, a spectator control, start control. And then in this window, you will see them all here. You'll as long see all as the that, controls all the, that are currently all the, active. All the, for the yeah, event. all the radio controls here. And, and it'll tell you how strong the, the signal is between them and like the battery levels and everything. And so as long as the master is picking them all up, then when people finish, the information will automatically come through, through without any, having to do anything else. Yeah. Right. Cool. Thanks for giving that overview. Uh, I think we covered everything that, at least on my mind, but I've never set up the computer. So is there anything else that's uh, noteworthy about how to set these um, things up? And is there any advice for smaller clubs that are looking at, maybe they've just got their computer and they're using Sport Ident, but they haven't taken a, a step to do any of these spectator friendly things? What are the things you think are most beneficial um, or any advice for smaller clubs? I know, I know that this software is kind of new and a lot of people haven't had the chance to um, really look into it yet, but I've found that just, just by playing around with it and just connecting things to um, connecting things up is actually really, it works really well. And I found this program a lot easier than um, other softwares. And another thing that's really good about this software that Philip Harry's has made is that if you have any ideas or things to make it better, you can just email him and he'll give you feedback and he'll actually improve it. I know that I've been doing a lot of enduro races specifically, and there hasn't been any way of having sport in for enduro races. And uh, so enduro he, mountain biking. Enduro mountain biking, yeah. And he's basically created an entire um, part of the software just for enduros that basically does it all for you. And I found that really helpful as well. Um, another thing also is that there's this program here called uh, what we use Sport Edit Config. Um, I'll just just put it here. So this this software here is really useful as well because this is what we use to reprogram all the Sport Edit boxes and um, set up basically basically a lot of the time before an event where we have to make sure all the the like the start and the finish are synced to the computer so that the timing is right. Basically, all you need to do is plug the boxes into the software and um, you can adjust the time. You can adjust what the control number is, um, uh, the accuracy of the time as well. If you're doing a mountain bike event, you can time it to 0.1 of a second versus just the standard one second accuracy that orienteering uses. So yeah, there's, there's, it's actually a pretty simple to set up. And this is software from sport idea. Not sport and yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And we this this usually i i got this to northwest but i'm i'm sure this is easily accessible as well um so yeah no it is it is very what it is actually a lot simpler than it sounds <laughs> um yeah cool well thanks for that and i'll also be uh, talking to <clears throat> jan from northwest as well about how to set up the radio controls properly. So yeah, thanks for uh, that advice and I hope people find it useful. Hi, Jan. I've just been talking to Daniel Moncton who was doing a lot of the tech stuff for New Zealand orienteering champs. And so he's brought me up to speed with the uh, use of Olynx and how the computers and stuff connect together. I was keen to hear from you what you've learned over um, the years, I think it is, kind of managing the radio controls and yeah you were running the radio controls for new zealand champs 
Yes, that's right. Um, well, maybe first of all, there, uh, there are a few reasons why we want to use radio controls. I, I think the most important one is that they give excitement, they bring excitement to an event because we can follow the competitors uh, while they're going through their course and we can see the intermediate punch times that are relayed back via the radios to the event center. Uh, we're also increasingly for the smaller events using using the radios as a safety measure. So we know out we know who is out in the field and we know who has passed um, certain radio controls. So even if people and we see that sometimes we begin as if they leave um, without downloading, we at least know where they have been and potentially we know that they have gone past the finish. So mm. that's another reason we use them. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we've used them quite a bit. Um, they are um, they're quite easy to set up. Um, there are a few tricks that you need to need to be aware of. Um, well, first of all, you need to set the control boxes so that they forward all the punches to the radios, and then the radios will relay the punches, which is the the, the spot ident number and uh, and the punch time back to the um, the main computer in the event center. Um, with the SI air cards, it works slightly differently because the SI air cards do not actually, um, that, well, they do, they do not require a physical punch of the control box. What they do is they listen to a beacon signal that's transmitted by the by the control box. So the SI air cards actually have a complete radio transmitter and receiver built in. So when they receive the oh. beacon signal, which means they are very close to the control, like 20, 30 centimeters away, the beacon signal will tell them the control number and the control time. It will also tell them to relay the punch to the radio that's standing nearby right. the control. With the SI box tells the uh, the sport agent card, the E card, to send the signal to the radio. That's right. Huh. That's kind of backwards to how you would expect. You would imagine that the SI card sends a signal to the control box which would then, that, that SI box would then pass it on to the radio itself, which, so that's how it would work for just the old style uh, SI cards that you have to punch into the hole. It would go from SI card to box and then to the radio, but yes. with SI air, it goes the other way around. Yeah, the downside of that is that um, when you place the radio, you obviously don't want the radio stand and the radio unit to be in the way of the runner. So you have to put it somewhere where it's out of the way. And in some cases, if a runner um, runs away from the radio and goes very, goes very fast past the, the radio control, sometimes it's already too far when it receives the send, send your information to the radio mm -hmm. message and, and you will miss a punch. Well, the radio controls do not actually impact on the on the on the official results mm -hmm. of the event, so it doesn't matter. It's a little bit annoying, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's just a bit sneaky for commentary when somebody <laughs> comes running through and you haven't seen them at any yeah, of the radio that's controls. Right. And I that's guess right. you could get around that by having radios surrounding the control so that they can relay that signal to uh, the radio. Uh, transmitter, no matter which direction they exit, but I guess you're starting to get quite expensive if you're having yeah, that, that's right. Radios but, um, per control. Well, I, I always think it's more important that the radio is not in the way than that you uh, get 100% of the of the punches. Mm -hmm. So, how, how do you set up these uh, radio controls? Are they attached to the SI box to to the control itself? Or what? So the um, we, we've got a number of different units. So the, the, the first one is the master radio, which is co uh, connected to the main computer that's running the event, running the, the Olink software. Okay, that's so the computer yeah. at the finish. Yeah, I think Daniel Munger mentioned that yeah. there was there was a USB cable that goes into the the finished computer that is yes, that's right. talking that's right. to that radio control. Yeah. And you'll see that when we use the radios, you will see the master radio typically uh, somewhere high up, as high as possible at the um, at the uh, somewhere at the corner of the tent uh, where we have the the, okay. the master computer. So if you look around at the finish, you might actually see it sneakily placed somewhere. Yeah, that's right. And you will also see the the radio at the finish, which um, yeah is obviously in, usually in the in the event center. Mm -hmm. You put it high up because radio signals, um, the, the way radio signals uh, uh, 
travel propagate means that if you put um, put radio up higher, there are, there are probably less obstacles in the way to the nearest uh, nearest radio at, at a control. And so the technology obstacles are like trees and hills and vehicles. And people and people. as well. <laughs> yeah, especially close to the event center, there's always lots of people. So you don't want people that consist mostly of water. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that they may absorb the radio waves and thereby, um, uh, in well, interfere with the, the radio signals. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason why we put radio at the, at the event center fairly high up. Um, then the radios actually form a, a kind of a mesh network in the sense that from a control, um, the radio, uh, the signal can be sent back to the event center via different paths. And it doesn't necessarily need to be from the radio control directly to the event center. It can, can go via a number of other radios that are in between and network or the radio network will just find a way to get those punches back to the to the to the event center and the event center will ac actually send a confirmation back to the to the control that or to the radio at the control that it has it has received it okay so and not all of those radio transmitters are at control sites i think some of them are called relay we call them relay transmitters and they might just be halfway between the spectator control that has a yes. radio and and the event center so mm. that forms part of that mesh network you were talking about there's radios out in the forest that are at a specific control that maybe the commentary wants to talk about and there can just be other radio transmitters that are out there in fact i think i might have occasionally i see one when you're just running along a track and there's a, a little stand in the ground just with a little aerial and yeah that's right that's right because these um the reach of a radio is is very dependent on the terrain so um it is a, a wi-fi like technology uh, operating at, at at the wavelength where you can go pretty fast if you have a direct line of sight between uh, between two radios so no obstacles in between for instance um a terrain like a map like turkey ridge which is very open you can easily go a kilometer and okay, if you like have better hilltop intent, to hilltop. well hilltop to hilltop yes wow. and um actually I, I read an article from uh, from a supplier uh, philip harris that uh, if you re use dedicated or high gain antennas you can go up to 10 kilometers between hilltops or mountaintops yeah. but that is that is very uh, very unusual uh, usually we use them in in well in the forest or in a combination of of open land and and forest and the range can be anywhere from just 100 meters or less to uh, to that kilometer and um what is particularly nasty for these the radio waves at these frequencies is if you have hills um you may have a perfectly fine signal if a control control is on the say on the event center side of the hill you go across the hill on the other side you may have no signal at all mm -hmm. that's an example where you would be forced to put a one of these repeater units that just relays the information between radios put that on the on the hilltop we had okay. one of those so situations in the control on the side of yep. the hill you'd put yep. a radio at the top and then the yep. event center might be on the other side and that's how you the signal wouldn't go through the hill but you can get it that's up right and then down. yeah okay yeah you probably probably haven't noticed, but we had one of these situations at the middle event at the Nationals this time. We had okay. uh, just two, two radios literally 10 meters apart. Oh, right. Just what? Just to get just the signal to, up higher just, just and to then get, to get it further. Get across the, yeah, get on to the other yeah. side of the hill. So yeah. when you're in a pine forest like Whittle Forest, how far do the signals travel on the flat? Well, it, it, it's a bit hard to say. It also depends on whether if, if there is a lot of, if there are a lot of well, it w wouldn't happen in a pine forest, but if you, in a forest, if you had a lot of wet leaves, the, uh, the signal wouldn't go as far as when it's completely dry. Mm -hmm. If you have a lot of, well, higher undergrowth, it will also, um, the reach will also be less than when it's completely mm -hmm. open. So uh, the, the higher the runability, also the, the further the radio waves go, I would say. Mm -hmm. But hills are tr probably more of an obstacle than, um, than, the, than the vegetation. Okay. In some terrain that was what where we used the middle distance for new zealand champs that was it wasn't the fastest it was kind of moderate to fast so slight there was it was some slight some lower branches how far were the radio controls separated um uh, it would probably be between hundreds 100 and 300 meters okay um 
yeah again it depends a bit because uh, the hills also have the advantage that if you if you do need a repeat and you have a hill it actually uh, helps mm. yeah, if right. you put a re the repeat on the hill mm. which we did as well cool. and can you check yeah. the signals when you're setting up the, the, the network yeah you can because you can uh, there's a little button on the master radio that if you press that it will send a, um, a, a signal every second and it, so you, you switch that on and then you start walking away with your radios and you check the signal strength. There are a number of LEDs that indicate the signal strength. You see them light up in that, in that one second frequency. So once that, um, that, that periodic um, signal or that light flashing disappears, you know you're out of reach and you need okay. to go back and place a repeater. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you could it's quite easy. Walk, walk out in the morning and kind of figure out quite easily how many repeaters you need to place just by looking at the lights on the the radio transmitters yeah that's right um you need to be careful though if you go out with a bunch of radios that you don't switch them all on because you will then see the the signal strength of some of the other radios that you're carrying you, with you so you you switch them on one by one mm. you go as far as you can hopefully to the first control otherwise uh, to a place a suitable place mm. for a repeater and then you go from and Ooh. you set them out. One thing that's um, that's useful is um, you typically have very good propagation along uh, tracks, when especially when they're straight and open. Okay. So There's you a may not. No trees. Yeah. yeah, perfectly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So in some cases, um, it's easier to go a little bit sideways and not directly to the control, but um, go to a, a path and follow the path mm -hmm. or the route for for the long distance, and then go right. into. So the if forest. you've got a control, you could put a repeater on a nearby track and then another uh, repeater on the track that could be maybe 300, 400 meters away. That's right. Yeah, as opposed to doing straight line. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. Yep. Cool. And how how much has uh, Northwest Orienteering in invested in those um, repeaters that add the radio controls? How much does it cost to set up the system? I think they were probably the radio units were probably something like like four or five hundred dollars each. Okay. Um, but they were purchased, I think um, it was before my time, but purchased through funding um, relation to Oceania. Okay. So all three Auckland clubs okay. got a set of radios, and we uh, we we share them. So we, uh, we we in many cases we use the radios from the Auckland club as well. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. As a computer share, it's really. Really cool the change that that's brought. Uh, getting the a, a little insight into how the competition is unfolding. Uh, yeah, during the races, I think it's really cool. And yeah, I hope yeah, to I see it was, more um, of it. it was especially powerful at the um, at the relay at the, at the last nationals. It was really um, mm -hmm. yeah, good to see. Cool. All right. Well, thanks for outlining all that for us, Jan. Okay. No worries. So, Tom, that wasn't too hard to understand and hopefully quite useful for uh, a number of clubs who were looking into increasing the, um, I guess, publicity and spectator, uh, spectator appeal of their local and regional and maybe even bigger events in the future. Yeah, I think, I think hearing it, it's, I mean, when you just sit down and take it all in one hit, it sounds quite complicated. But actually getting down to it, it's actually like not, not too too bad and I, I think for clubs it's a you probably save a bit of work really running an electronic timing system especially if you just have like a screen output from a laptop I mean you put your results right there everyone can see where they fit in um, you could even do away with the printer perhaps for splits um, yeah I think it I think if I'd probably have to sit down a couple more times to fully get my head around all of it but um, yeah yeah, it just shows you as well, lots goes in behind the background of running a big orienteering event. Yeah, and I think from a, a club perspective, it's important to have a few people who can run that kind of stuff. And as you saw, uh, Daniel Mugton's relatively young, and so he can keep those skills as long as he's with the club. And then we just need someone younger to come through and pick up the skills. And so you've got this, yeah, rolling knowledge with two or three people in the club who can run that kind of stuff on the day and, and Olinx, Olinx yeah. also isn't the only system as well and they talked about me they talked about 
uh, OE runner or something? Yeah, OE is uh, OE twenty ten was whatever. kind of yeah what I remember trying to use like yeah. five or six years ago, and I think Olynx is. There's another one called another one we use at Obot called Neos. So there's lots of different okay. ways to do it. They're yep. relatively straightforward. Um, I think that yeah, something that it would be potentially quite intimidating, but mm-hmm. once you actually sit down and have a go, it's not too bad. Yeah. Um, and the, the thing that I'd like to um, recommend for clubs as well who are looking at that kind of stuff is is really just to empower a few people to do it and provide them with the time and the resources to really learn it well and just let that person run with it and give them the control as opposed to letting people who probably shouldn't be trying to play with the technology um, letting it fall on them is is very stressful and I've never played with this stuff and I'm totally fine with that because we have people who can and I don't want to think about that kind of stuff when I'm running the event I want someone else to think about all of it we could be quite diverse clubs and there's often a niche to find now yeah. we talked about um finishes and radio controls and that sort of thing there with Jan and Daniel so we I think for coaching this month we're going to focus on something a little different we we're going to hone in on spectator run-throughs and phases of your race and some of the more mental skills that you might employ, I don't know, at, at, at nationals, for instance. Um, hopefully people watching will have some reference points themselves that they can think about how they might apply these. So, Gene, do you have a, a map you can pull out for us that has a spectator run-through? No, I think the woman's. I think the woman's middle from <laughs> nationals yeah, that we like, the Lincoln it's like Not even. Okay. Okay. There we go. You can <laughs> like that. wasn't. You can edit. <laughs> yeah, I did that. I wasn't even in the list. It's like. Okay. There we go. Yeah. So this is the W twenty one E course from nationals middle distance. Mm-hmm. and this is a terrifying race for me. I much prefer the long distance where you have a bit more time to settle in and there's less time pressure on your navigation. So the pressure is so hot from the start and you know these competitors two minutes in front of you and behind you, uh, you're going to possibly see other runners out there and your mental state going into this is pretty highly strung in, in my experience and So let's fast forward to number 15. You've just had a ripper of a run. You're going great. And you punch 15, look down at your control descriptions and see that you have a spectator run through. Can you pull the map down to 15, Gene? Yeah. What what goes through your head when you punch that control and enter the spectator run through? Yeah. So I I think I'm more a more mature orientee now and but I do have to be honest, the first thing that goes around my head is about running fast in front of everyone and not only getting like, taking advantage of the fact that I can run fast without having to navigate because there's a run through, but also that other people are watching. And so that's what hits me first. And then I have to kind of override that and realize that I need to be investing this time into planning these very important and very tricky final controls. Mm. Is there anything you think of at the start of the race when you know there's a run through? Do you prepare yourself in any way? Uh, Yeah, probably less of at the start of the race and more so say 14 to 15. Mm -hmm. I might not be so obsessed about planning ahead. For example, if I'm going from 14 to 15, some part part of me would like to plan 17, 18, 19. But if I know that I have a bit of a run through, then maybe I don't worry about planning 17, 18, 19 until the run through, as opposed to planning it while executing 14 to 15. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's, that's probably the, the, the only so you, so change your ta- in strategy. Yeah. So your tactic is to find something that you can consume your mind with on the run through to stay yeah. focused on the map. Yeah. Otherwise I just get... The alternative is maximum hype 
and maximum pace <laughs> while while spectators are, are looking and that ends badly so often yeah how about yeah. you i guess i guess mine is actually sounds completely different but it's actually pretty much the same thing so mm. i'm the opposite from you i will on coming into f- coming 14 to 15 i will think about the leg after the run through so i'll think what's my exit direction and how am i going to be leaving that control so i've already started thinking about that because once i get to 15 all i try and put in my head is the control codes for my next few controls so mm-hmm. on the run through i'm just staying focused on what are my next two control codes what are my next two control mm-hmm. codes um i don't trust myself to make good decisions there so i run fast take advantage of the fact it's taped all I'm thinking of it would be the control codes for 16 and 17. Once I punch 17, I've already planned mm-hmm. my exit direction and a basic plan, and then I take off. So mm-hmm. I'm again, it's mental scheduling, right? So yeah. we are saying that while we think about different things, it's important to have pre-planned what thoughts are going to be going through your head in this high-risk part of your course. Mm-hmm. Right. So that is a different kind of coping strategy, but I think we're both noticing that there is an increased risk of something going down here. Mm, definitely, definitely. So, okay, so we've made it safely through the spectator league. Um, what we've got here is something we often see in middle distance races overseas as well. Um, I mean, it's a common, I think, to Jaywalk and what courses, you have a spectator run through 80% of the way through your course or 90% of the way through your course and then a short loop, high risk. You've seen, you've literally seen the finish. Um, you have to be able to manage the risk in this and h- how do you have any strategies when you enter this phase of the race? Uh, high pressure last loop? Yeah, I'm, it, it's hard to uh, kind of shed wisdom uh, credibly here because I tend to screw up these middle distances enough that I almost don't feel qualified and we should really be talking to some of the middle distance pros out there. Um, but the times that I do my worst is when I've allowed the emotions to really take over and for me to really increase the speed to full throttle without getting the navigation right. And I mean, like, bad compass and no plan. So if we think back to, for example, when I did a leg-by-leg video with Joe Lynch after his win at Nationals Middle Distance last year, he was going balls to the wall for that whole race, but his compass was so good the whole time. And so I don't want you to get those things confused. Um, I'm not saying don't go full throttle, but your technique has to be on point first and foremost. And... His was, where, whereas I tend to get a, a bit too caught up in the the hype and the finish is right there and I know I'm a strong runner and if only I could just cane this last loop, I can pull another place. Yeah, that's that's my, my dilemma. Mm, mm. Okay, so it's all about trying to externalize all of those influences, trying yeah. to stay focused on your process. Yeah, so especially guess, if the commentary mentions my name or something, like if the commentary says I'm doing well or something like that, you know, it, it, the chance of me screwing up upon that announcement is getting pretty high. Uh, it, it just goes goes to my head here. Yeah. So I guess if you were to kind of distill it down, you could say the race hasn't finished at the spectator run through. You still have to uh, remain focused on your orienteering yep. process and not the whole navigate better, but rather focus on your direction simplification know where you're going yeah all of this with the caveat that neither of us are particularly renowned middle distance runners yeah absolutely whatever technique's been working for you for the rest of the race stick to it this is not a time to find the sixth gear that you didn't have for the rest of the race trying to find it now is is opening a can of worms i think the other situation where we might have something like this is in relays now do we have a relay we can jump to yeah well well we'll jump to uh, a video that i made for the uh coaching framework 
for the okay. ONZ, ONZ website. And uh, I think it's an interesting idea there about how to deal with these external factors that, that come into our orienteering, like we're trying to just orientate our way through, but when these external influences like other people or commentary kind of clutter our mental space and increase the pressure, then weird things happen. And you can see good orienteers do dumb things on simple maps because they're trying to go fast under pressure. And especially if the map is maybe pushing you quite wide or you, you can't just go straight on the compass every time, then strange things happen. And most of it comes down to, I think, the mental scheduling that you mentioned earlier. Okay. When, yeah, so let's check out the video. And so this is a mass start exercise, right? Yeah, you can do it as a as a mass start or starting runners very close together, but it really oh, it really clutters your, your mental space and makes things very hectic. And being able to deal with that is the key to becoming a successful uh, elite orienteer. All right, let's watch the video. This is an example of a quick thinking exercise. If you're looking for a way to use an area that might not seem useful for red level orienteering, then this can be a really good way. This area is very green, the contours are not terribly detailed, and there's lots of mountain bike tracks. One way you can use this area to stress out a red level orienteer is to get them to do a fairly fast effort with lots of controls um, and set the controls so that there's a lot of route choices, not necessarily huge route choices, but they can be quite short and wide. For example, going from two to three, there are a number of options. You could do straight through the white, uh, there's around both both sides on the, the trail, there's also a kind of another straight way. And it's not that the difference between one option and the other is, is a total game changer, but you have to commit to one and you have to choose in advance. So there's a lot going through the orienteer's head while they do two to three. And they've still got to figure out the exit direction for four, which is super niggly because you've got all this very slow running forest in between three to four. So, you know, they're really looking for like the track like that, or maybe there's another way to use these tracks here to have high confidence and high speed at the same time. And what you find is you can put really good orienteers into an area that doesn't look appropriate. But if you set uh, a, a kind of course like this, where there's a lot of temptation to use tracks and get them to do it fast, then it has this sprint orienteering like effect where you're having to make these really quick decisions. And because the forest is, is uh, there might be undergrowth and is quite dense, they're, they're not having, they can't just read the map at their own leisure. And you'll see some pretty interesting things happen when uh, then orienteers are not looking closely enough at the map and making very quick decisions and I mean they're even missing junctions running on wrong tracks taking terrible bearings so you can you can stress out quite good orienteers by putting them in hectic little area with a, a course like this success on this kind of exercise is when you're in control and you have this sense of flow where you're looking at the map all the time and it just feels natural to keep looking at the map keep looking at the map and you're always a few steps ahead of yourself and you're then planning ahead as soon as you've ticked off a few boxes and to make these exercises more intense you can mass start them or you can start runners with uh, a short interval between them so there's always the pressure of someone just in front and someone just behind and additional distractions you could set it like a relay with uh, some split controls so that people are getting pulled off their line by other people who are actually going to a slightly different control uh, any way to overdrive that sense of mental intensity where you're trying to stay focused on the map but there's all these other hectic things going on around you cool. Cool. so i hope that was clear enough and then gets across uh, the gist of of this challenge which is yeah really a mental one i mean that map isn't super tricky uh, that example it's even worse if the map is tricky but this is largely a mental problem that comes in with these relays with run-throughs and commentary and runners close together. Yeah, so I, I think that's great. That's a heaps of clubs have terrain, which maybe isn't like A grade, A level event grade, um, but that shows you can still get really good training outcomes. So the key learnings from today are um, think about mental scheduling. If you've got a time when you're going to be affected by emotions, 
make sure you've got a really clear thought process to go through. Um, if you've got a run through or a relay, you need to stick to your process more than ever. Um, try and not be influenced by those externalizing forces. And last of all, there's an example of how you can train this and how you can work on that fast thinking with all of those external influences and trying to push them out. What do you reckon? Sounds about right, Gene? Yeah, I think I think that sounds about right. And just to clarify a few things, often I think you, you might talk to someone who's just one middle distance at New Zealand Champs and some of these more experienced elite runners, and you might hear them talking about a strategy that's quite contrary to what we are saying. They might be doing something that's a lot riskier or at least seems a lot riskier to someone who's less experienced. And yeah, I don't think we're disagreeing, but I think what you and I are saying is kind of applies for most people and applies for almost everyone that isn't super pro you and I included in, in the field of middle distance. I'm not super pro. Yeah. I'm, wa- I'm washed up. <laughs> but I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. So we, you might you might hear from some Matt Ogden and he's doing some some bonkers thing where he's reading like one feature on the way to the control and going full speed in a middle distance. And he we're, can do we're, that we're tailoring this to mere, we're tailoring this to mere mortals. This is yeah. mortal level orienteering. Yeah. Um so that's the that's you and I and most people who are probably watching. Now yep. we've got some information from around the country, just some recent happenings. Um we are starting off with South Island Champs, which have just happened. I think this map was used for Nationals Long uh, some years ago, maybe. Yeah, I was um, a junior. I was a junior when I ran Nationals Long Distance here. I remember when we yeah, had Nationals really enjoyed Long it. here. I think, the, I think when Nationals Long was here, maybe Jamie Stewart or Greg Flynn found a control in the wrong place moved oh. it before Oof. all of the later people could come through Oof. controversial but Oof. hey they saved the race yeah, i can, you have, I'd to, have to check my facts on that one but i think it, i think it was on here wow. was it 2011 i i can't remember maybe young, i think i was younger than that i remember we ran like 17 we ran like 17 kilometers well, and it is fast yeah i had a good time here because this was legging it across this open farmland um but it's very fun to rain. Like these boulders are a big, a lot of big pillars and the gaps between them can be quite narrow. Uh, so I think that's, that's Australia, isn't it? Australia with <laughs> marginally fewer yeah, trees. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the super fun. We're taking a look at the, this is the W18 course, which I thought was quite fun and a nice mix of uh, mm. middle and, and longer and shorter legs. Nice long leg uh, in there. Yeah. Into these boulders. I think this is, it's really fun, fun stuff. And yeah, I would have, I, I didn't make it down, but it's certainly a place I look forward to returning to, to do some orienteering. And yeah. I think legs like this where nine to 10, you're running downhill and it looks kind of easy. And so you've kind of gone a bit too hot and haven't paid, paid enough attention to your direction and your, you're drifting off a little bit and then you're faffing around in, in the wrong boulders and you can easily just bleed time like that on this map because all the boulders look so similar. Nice. Ah, very jealous. I didn't make the trip either, but just talking to that yeah. map makes me think maybe I should have. Um, there was another, I guess we could say a fifth of internationals. There was the sprint, the middle, the relay, the long and the knockout sprint. Yeah, there's a knockout sprint and Joe Lynch, who won the knockout sprint, uh, actually had a head cam on. So he's put up some videos on, on YouTube that you should check out. Uh, the, the link um, will be provided, um, but also you can search Joe Lynch orienteering on YouTube and you should be able to find him. And so he's got some cool videos on the mass starts himself. And... Uh, yeah, there's there's a lot going on here. So nice one, nice one, Joe. Some good Pretty content cool. going yeah. on. Well, and, and staying on sprint, there's some. Um, you found some interesting mapping uh, discussion in yeah. relation to sprint. Yeah, that's right. So uh, the 
Orienteering International uh, Facebook page has, has a lot of good discussion, I think. And this was a little thing that I just wanted to communicate to mappers. This was presented just as a, a question about how they would like this area to be mapped, just a mapper. A lot of people just ask questions and there's always these ambiguous areas with orienteering mapping and it's good to get some feedback from the community about what the consensus is. And uh, my consensus on this one was that option E was, was the best and Clarity. There was a, a, fairly, a fairly strong Clarity. consensus uh, yep. in the in the discussion that E uh, was preferred. Yeah, there's there's the reasoning with most people is that it's just all out of bounds, so all uninteresting. Correct. You know, it, it's it's just it's actually not relevant. This is not a D running down that green map. strip on D would be a controversial route choice. Yes. And that's also an out of bounds symbol now in the new, yeah, in the controversial new route choice. Yeah. No, I agree. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's all out of bounds. So why yeah. Map it? Uh, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. 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 Silliness. Cool. So that's one example. This example didn't have quite such a strong consensus, but though there, there are these two colors in, in the sprint orienteering symbol set, which have been clarified in the new ice prom standard to reflect the amount of traffic that is present on certain paved areas. Um, I would like to understand more whether this is supposed to be, you know, a bit of a, a danger thing or what's exactly it's supposed to be indicating. And E on this one kind of looked like the consensus that, that came out is that people C are not that also, interested. C is also, okay but i guess the thing it's just hard to would, see the edges of I, the thing i would wonder about is sure they've like mapped all the brick areas as low traffic but what about the driveway that's on the right of the picture that i mean that's got the potential for confusion right yeah so exactly uh, yeah i'm at, as someone who's done a bit of mapping i'm still not entirely clear on exactly what iof meant by the higher traffic whether it was parked cars or is it dangerous a dangerous place to run i'm not entirely sure but e seemed to kind of be the consensus but it wasn't wasn't quite as strong yeah so good discussion on the facebook page if you're a mapper and you're on facebook check out the orienteering international mappers nice and then last of all we are uh, looking at a um another nation which is having a go at the um, map ant project so yep. nzo map is our version yep. finland is the original i think norway's also got one mm -hmm. so this project is headed i believe by manu gerardo who's actually my age and went through uh, junior world champs and various other competitions with and he studied uh, mapping and gis stuff and so took the reins of this project in spain and is gathering all the LiDAR data, similar to what Cameron Delisle is doing in New Zealand and processing it all bit by bit and has got a good chunk of, of Spain done. And here's a little snippet of somewhere in Spain. And I've run on some terrain that's like this in Spain. These, these smooth hills, but big hills and kind of rough, low, mm. low kind of conifer trees that are a bit spiky and you have to bash under them and all very, very dry uh, and, and not quite as many cliffs as shown here. I think the, the Carta Palatin automatic map generator picks up a few cliffs that are probably just steep, mm. steep slopes and not really cliffs, but check it out. Um, Mapant.es. You can explore a very large auto generated map of Spain with orienteering, orienteering symbols and colors. Very cool. So yeah, wow. it's still a fair amount more to do, but they've done half the country. So pretty good going. Cool. Very nice. Great. So um, to close this week, we will have something to uh, ponder and think about. And what I was going to put to you, Jane, is we've talked a little bit about relays. We've just had nationals relay. It's a, 
it's a format that we seldom get to run in New Zealand. What is a type of relay format that you really enjoy? It could be one that we already have in New Zealand, mm. all night relays, knockout or sprint relays. Mm. Um, or is there something else? What would you go for? If you could run any sort of relay in New Zealand and for bonus points, what sort of terrain would you want to do it on? Mm. I, I like the, the classic relay actually. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's the, the thing that appeals the most to me is the best start actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think starting head to head is something very special in orienteering and it brings out some pretty interesting, interesting qualities. And I think it's very interesting how much deeper we can push physically when we're head to head uh, with our competition. And so I particularly like running first leg and really going at a, at a speed that I would struggle to maintain by myself if I was solo in the forest and just put pushing new limits like that. So, um, and I find in, in a, a forest relay, you have a bit more of a chance of doing that over 35 minutes, really exceeding expectations. Um, I think in a sprint, uh, we all go pretty fast most of the time, um, but in the forest, there's an extra gear, like a, mm, a full yeah. gear that you can find when you are really just focused on trying to beat somebody else um, head nice. to head. So yeah, nice. that's my favorite. Cool. Do you have Very a favorite? Good. Well, I, I, following on from the mass start theme, I think there's some interesting formats where you can have everyone starting together. Um, mm. Say we had one Auckland champs years ago on Hobsonville Airbase. Teams of three randomly made up from a club drawn from a hat mm -hmm. um, and you had to collect all of the controls um, as a between the three of you. Mm -hmm. And I think there were maybe each person had to get a minimum of something. Um, right. Everyone started off together and then had to be back mm -hmm. in a certain time. So it's kind of a relay, sort of yeah, a team there's a, thing. But there's extra planning, mm, this allocate, allocation good. between the different people is an interesting challenge that yeah. it's kind of like row gaining plus like there's, yeah, there's something extra to that that I imagine some people are better yeah. at than others. I think relays like that, relays like that are interesting. Mm. Things that bring together people who are of different skills. Anyway, that's enough for this month. Um, thanks for catching up, Gene. Was a good chat. Um, yeah. And same thing again next month. See you guys next month. Thanks for watching. Bye. If you liked the show, please support it by sharing this podcast with one person who would benefit from it. The best place to find more content like this is at genebeverage.nz, where you can find years of training blogs, race reports, podcasts, and coaching videos. If you don't want to miss future episodes, I recommend subscribing to my newsletter by visiting genebeverage.nz or by following on social media, Perfect Flow on Facebook and Gene Beverage on Instagram. For Q&A, send messages to nav at perfectflow.nz.